And my dad, being a Freemason, uh, he was chaplain of his lodge. In a nutshell, they would claim to be a social club that has ritual. If a brother Mason commits a murder or treason, they're obliged basically to look after their own. The headquarters for a lot of those in New Zealand, there's two main areas. One is uh, Havelock North, Masonic ritual abuse. The ritual abuse happened in a Masonic Lodge. Trouble is, a lot of police are members of the Masonic Lodges as well. Oh, well, I'm Selwyn Stevens. I am from New Zealand, from Otago in the South Island, uh, but now living in Manawatu in uh, the North Island. And I'm the author of, well, I stopped counting at 35 books uh, on different range of issues. And um, now the top 25 of them are now on Amazon globally. So um, that that's uh, quite exciting, really. Well, this, this is our top seller, um, Unmasking Freemasonry, Removing the Hoodwink. Um, I, I put this together in request from a series of meetings that I was doing uh, in a Baptist church in New Zealand, and um, he wanted me to cover some other spiritual deceptions as well, like the Mormons, JWs, and uh, spiritualism, and people wanted my notes, and so they grew into a book. This has gone through seven editions um, and has a foreword from... Uh, a good friend who's passed away now, Dr. C. Peter Wagner from Colorado, who was professor of church growth at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. So uh, he had me speak at one of their conferences with two and a half thousand people, and I led them through the prayer renouncing Freemasonry so that uh, they could uh, be set free. For, for me, the issue really was uh, seeing families, including my own, with what I would regard as Masonic curses operating. And uh, I just decided I needed to study this in order to work out what, what needed to be done. Um, and that was mostly during the 1980s. And I remember taking my, my dad with a group of people to Dunedin one time to the town hall where Dr. Derek Prince was teaching and he's probably one of my favorite Bible teachers uh, of all time. Um, and he talked about the five principalities that controlled Dunedin, which is our fifth uh, biggest city now. It used to be just about number one. Um, and one of them was Freemasonry. And my dad, being a Freemason, uh, he was chaplain of his lodge. He was a Knight Rose Croy. And he... Um, he had some questions on the way home, <laughs> which is fine. And I didn't know all the answers, but I was starting to pay attention to this. And um, a wee bit later on, I was able to talk to his pastor, who I knew quite well, um, who was not only born again, but uh, had a very good understanding of the spiritual realm. And uh, he was able to explain things to my dad in such a way that uh, my dad renounced Freemasonry before he died, which I'm most grateful for. Um, so um, it's, I've seen its effect in families. Um, one, one of the things that I found very interesting is why do men join this? And there's, there's a number of reasons uh, for that. I think the, the predominant reason is a chance to get ahead in business if they're in business. Um, because they do special deals with each other. Um, I, I would say there's an element of pride that they learn secrets that nobody else supposedly knows. Trouble is, so much of it has now been exposed. Um, it's not secret anymore. And I think what holds them in there is just fear, because every degree that they go through the ritual, first degree, um, they promise not to share the secrets of that degree. And so they go through a little ritual where they actually make a, a sign of cutting their own throat from ear to ear to say, that can happen to me if I share the secrets in this degree. Second degree is to have your heart ripped out. Third degree uh, is, is to um, cut your stomach out. Um, 
and we call that nowadays a colostomy. So we've actually found, and through some very good friends of mine who had done some research on this, that a lot of health issues in families are to do with the part of the, deg of the degree that their father or grandfather was in in the lodge. Um, give you an example. I was speaking in Melbourne, Australia, at a big Baptist church, and uh, probably had about 50 pastors in that particular meeting. And I happened to make a statement of, you can tell where uh, somebody's father or grandfather was, what the degree level uh, in the lodge, by what are the major problems in the health of their family. And I, I had the pastor who was hosting me uh, challenged me on that on the way home. And I said, well, um, you know, you do your own research on it, but that's what I found. Well, over six months later, he rang me quite out of the blue and he reminded me of my comment. And I said, so what did you find? And he said, well, he said, my wife and I are actually professional counsellors. We each see uh, eight people a day, five days a week for counselling. He was the staff counsellor for, for the church. And so he said, we designed a questionnaire depending on what people came. Now, uh, to understand that's a church that's so big, they broadcast their uh, service live on two radio stations at the time anyway. I don't know if they still do. Um, and so therefore you don't do ministry in a church that's going to air. And so they, anybody who had an issue had to make an appointment and go and, and see this couple. So he said, that's 16 people a day, five days a week for nearly six months. He said, I can tell you, you're 100% right. Now, my research has shown that Australia per capita had more Freemasons than anywhere else on the planet. So I think that's a reasonable sample. It's anecdotal, but I think um, that was their research. So, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of people healed of health issues, both in their family and in themselves, uh, when people go through renouncing the key bits to do. We go through each of the degrees, um, and, and we've got their logos and so on relevant to, to each degree. We explain these are the, these are the words that are normal in, in the de different degrees, pretty well global. The first three degrees were called the Blue Lodge, Every degree is the same pretty well globally. I have not yet found any significant changes. Scandinavians have a slightly different structure um, than the British Commonwealth or the American um, systems, but they're, they're pretty much the same. So we would go through and explain, right, these are the issues with each of these degrees. If you want to be healed of something to do with that, then here's a template of what you could do. And so we actually had people in five countries from different ministries who were dealing with the same stuff um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And we sort of drafted a corporate prayer that we could all use. And there's lots of ministries all around the world that use the same stuff. Sometimes they say where it comes from, from our, uh, our book, uh, or if I, I don't really mind. Um, We've seen some absolute miracles, people healed of stuttering, people healed of heart disease, people healed of stomach cancers. And there's actually a list in there of the different areas of health that have been healed um, once people have gone through the prayer. So we're, we're excited with the fruit from it and the fruit is good. So when men go through the rituals and women do in women's lodges as well, um, they are speaking words that actually curse different parts of their body. I've mentioned the first three degrees already, but as they go higher and higher, um, they go into other parts of the body and so on that they're cursing. And so what happens is when they say those things, if they don't come on them as a person, they come on their family members because they're in a covenant and also a bloodline relationship. In a nutshell, they would claim to be a social club that has rituals. Um, in New Zealand, their grandmaster at the time described it in a newspaper interview as Rotarians with ritual. Um, in a nutshell, they, they started as a construction team. 
Back in about the 1200s in Scotland, it seems to be the origin of it as best we can tell. They claim they go all the way back to Solomon's Temple, but that's rubbish. There's no evidence of it and everything says otherwise. Um, they learned how to construct buildings, particularly religious ones, churches and cathedrals and so on. And so because people in those days were illiterate, they couldn't read and write, in order to determine what their competence level and pay scale was, um, they developed these little series of handshakes and passwords so that if you moved from one building site to another, you could say the right password and right handshake and they'd say, right, you're at this level of competence, we can give you this much work and this much pay. So um, that's partly, um, <laughs> I remember um, uh, an Anglican vicar friend of mine, um, she was saying to me, do you know how to tell a Freemason in your church? She had a church of about 400. And so I taught her how to do the Masonic handshake. <laughs> so she immediately knew who all the Masons were in her parish. <laughs> and she said, then I'm going to be praying for those guys that they wake up to what they're really in because they're a burden on their families quite apart from the parish. So um, anyway, right, there's, there's two kinds of Freemasons. There's the operative ones who still work in the construction. They build houses and so on. Um, but there's the speculative ones, and they could be lawyers or politicians or accountants or just anything. Um, in the 16 and 1700s, those people were sort of the landed gentry of Europe, particularly in Britain in particular. Um, they started to get involved because they had um, peasants who farmed their farms. They, did, they had money and they had too much time on their hands. And so they got involved in groups like the Theosophical Society um, and, and others. There were even the Knights Templar and other organizations like that. They were sort of loosely, I would call them, spiritistic a lot of them were into conspiracy theories. Some of them were involved in, in plots against the, the government or, or so on. And they found it easier to go and join the Masonic Lodges. 1717 was the Grand Lodge of England was, a, was founded. And from then on, all the Christian bits were removed from what had been before. And so it became a social club, but it also had a lot of rituals. And they've used their power... Um, I would say most of the governments of Africa and Asia have actually had a Masonic control. Latin America, uh, Simon Bolivar, who um, caused the Spanish to get evicted and, and therefore he created Masonic governments for the whole of Latin America. So, you know, and, and that, that's well documented if people know where to look for it. It's actually in my book as well. So um, they've used their political power to control. Uh, for example, a former Prime Minister in New Zealand, Keith Holyoke, became the Grand Master for the whole of New Zealand. He had 16 out of 18 cabinet ministers who were Freemasons. So they were there by their handshake, not by their competence. In New Zealand in the 1800s, most of the premiers, as they were described in those days, were members of the Orange Order. That, that's what got my dad into the Daddy Lodge. He was a member of the, the Orange Lodge, which is a Protestant one, uh, probably strongest in Northern Ireland, and they have these big marches on the 12th of July and some other times just to show the Catholics that they actually won the Battle of Boyne in 1600 or whatever it was. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of those guys... I think virtually every premier in the 1800s in New Zealand was a member of the Orange Order. From about 1900 onwards, they were just about all Freemasons, apart from maybe some in the early labor movement uh, in the 1930s. Um, I found no evidence that they were, but they were socialists, so they had other problems. Um, it's not so common. I would say that virtually every governor general of New Zealand has been a Freemason, even the women that have been. Um, there are exceptions, but there's not very many. So they sort of gravitate to control positions. Australia, um, 
there's a whole whole swag of their prime ministers. I've named some of them in my book. Menzies, yeah. Um, Harold Holt, the one wasn't he the one that disappeared? Um, they never found his body. Um, yeah, quite a few like that. Um, Canada, the same. Um, the US, um, not all presidents are, but the majority, I think, would be. Um, Britain would be the same. Well, it's definitely a conflict of interest for uh, politicians and so on um, to be members of groups like this. Um, how can I describe it? They actually promise to look after their own. Uh, even if a brother Mason commits a murder or treason, they're obliged basically to look after their own. And even if it means lying in court under oath, they will do that sometimes. So, uh, you know, that's not an, that's an integrity issue as far as I'm concerned. Um, but they, this is part of the promise they make in the rituals that they go through. Um, and I, I just, I find that difficult to, to sort of tolerate how um, people can do it with a conscience. But it's like their conscience gets said. Um, yeah, there's been... There's been some interesting events that they've uh, manufactured. I, I would have to say, I think Freemasonry has probably lost a lot of its strength. Uh, in New Zealand, their membership used to be about 48,000. Um, now I understand it's just a tad above 6,000. And I know anecdotally a lot of them have actually resigned and um, have found the real Jesus so that now they're in a better place. Um, I'd have to say that my, my role originally with, with my book was really to look at explaining to the wives and daughters of Freemasons why there are curses in their families. And when those girls wake up, the guys might as well not go anymore. And that's really been what's, what's happened. And I've heard that from a number of cases. Most of the major cult groups that grew out of Finney's revival that in the east coast of America in the uh, mid-1800s, the Mormons, the founder was a Freemason. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the founder was a Knights Templar in Freemasonry. The founder of the Adventists was a Freemason. The Spiritualist Church was involved with it. The Christadelphian one was, was with it. And so, you know, in case your uh, viewers are concerned, I'm not just about dealing with curses. I'm actually more about dealing with blessings. In fact, this book is now in 14 languages on Amazon because I really want people to be blessed. But you can't be really blessed until such time as you've got rid of the curses. And so that's that's really been my motive for being involved in um, trying to help these people understand. By gifting, I'm probably more of a teacher, and so I research things and I help share with, with people that are interested in freedom. And by doing that, I've been able to equip people on five continents. In, in the lower degrees, they, they sort of pretend that it's a Christian group, and in most of the Western world, it probably pretends to be that fairly successfully. Um, and it's only when you get up to the 30th degree, which is three steps from the top, um, that you're actually told that you worship Lucifer. So all the, they deliberately lie to their people in the lower levels. Now, when, when a man has gone through the rituals of the first three degrees, the fellow craft being the second, entered apprentices first, fellow craft, is second, Master Mason is third, and they're sort of told they've reached the pinnacle of the lodge. But if you look at a structure plan of this, of how they're set up, you'll realize you're barely up to the floorboards and hardly out of the basement. And as you go through all of these other degrees, um, you know, I, I can think of a friend of mine who used to be a Knight Templar. So that's about the second highest level that you can reach in most of the Western world. And he told me that he he learned, he came out of it and became a Christian, um, he learned that uh, he had to break five of the Ten Commandments in order to reach that degree. 
numbers one, two, three, six, and nine. So if you're going to go and do that, you're actually going to end up with God as your enemy. Now, I've mentioned about the different degree rituals that bring a curse that the men speak. Uh, And so when it comes to ministry, we really need to go through those and explain, um, okay, this is what we need to cover. Because of the political control that their top people are involved in, they really have controlled a lot of countries. I mean, I was asked to go to Africa to, to speak about this because every British regiment in the 1800s and so on had a Masonic lodge inside it. Bot- bottom line is wherever the British military went, and they remember they controlled a quarter of the world at one stage, um, including in New Zealand, uh, it was Masonic infiltration here through um, in the 1837, 8 onwards. And by 1840, they had Masonic lodges here. And most of the military campaigns by the British military here were held, the campaign meetings to plan what they were doing were held in Masonic lodges. And so this is why a lot of Maori have nothing to do with the lodge because they know there's a connection. And basically we had a coup um, where the, the British Masonic Empire, I'll call it what it really was, um, and, and as somebody who's uh, got a, a, de- a qualification from or uh, an honor from the Queen, I can say that I, I found it very difficult to say the whole British Empire basically was a Masonic um, Empire. And so there's lodges now in India and Singapore and all around the, uh, Africa and so on. Wherever they controlled, they controlled it to that level. Bottom line is this is... This has actually caused a lot of people to start looking seriously at the the political machinations that they've been involved in. Now, some people say, oh, well, it's a bit like Rotary or the Lions Club or whatever. Well, both of those groups were started by Freemasons. And the Scouts, yes, Baden-Powell was was a very prominent Freemason. You can tell that from his tombstone, but you won't know it if you don't know what the symbol is with the point within a circle. Uh, which is on his tombstone along with the scouting one. I was in a uh, cemetery, would you believe it, in Canada, in the city of Hamilton there, and the whole cemetery is laid out like a Masonic lodge. And you had to be a Freemason or a member of the Eastern Star, which is the women's lodge uh, in North America, uh, in order to have family buried in that place. And it had the table and the chairs and everything, the whole thing. The New Zealand Parliament is set up like a Masonic Lodge, the debating chamber, totally the same. The beehive is a Masonic symbol, and it's also the symbol of Utah, and that's because um, uh, Joseph Smith Jr. uh, got involved in the lodge, and when he was about to be gunned down because he'd been put in prison, he wasn't martyred because martyrs don't shoot back. He, he killed two and wounded a third when he was trying to escape from jail. And he was there because he was jailed for burning down a newspaper office that exposed some corruption that he was in. But while he was about to be gunned down, he was giving the Masonic uh, hailing sign of distress to tell the others. But because he had shared the Masonic secrets, um, they enacted what was common in North America at the time. You reveal the secrets and we'll kill you because you made an oath to do uh, for us to do that. So, you know, um, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses has a Knights Templar pyramid over his tomb. Um, it tells us exactly what they've got, complete with the, the logo on it and so on. So this is, we, if you know what you're looking for, you can see them in a lot of places. Um, the, the phallic symbol for war memorials, those are Masonic obelisks. The Washington Monument is one of the biggest in the world. The one in um, the, cor- the courtyard of St. Peter's in Rome is one of those. So, you know, we, we see these symbols, we don't recognize the spiritual implication of what it means. In Utah, for example, which is about 78% Mormon, um, they've just uh, elected a Mormon as head of the Freemasons for the state of Utah. Now, that's rare 
even though the founder was, and so Brigham Young was expelled from the Grand Lodge of Illinois and so on. I mean, all of that is, is well documented. Um, they were told not to join because they would find out that the rituals of their Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods are the first, second, and third degrees of Freemasonry. The rituals are exactly the same and so on. Um, free, um, Mormons, for example, wear sacred underwear. They've got a square and a compass on each breast. Uh, that comes out of Freemasonry. And I remember somebody saying on a radio interview about this, and, and the, the Mormon said, well, the Freemasons got it off us. No, it was the other way around. And that's now well established because of the dates of the founding. So um, some of these groups, now there are Mormons, for example, who are born again. But I also know a lot who have left the Mormon church in order to find the real Jesus. Um, JWs are a bit harder, but I know of people who have come out of them. Uh, they've closed down and sold off their, uh, their national headquarters in, in New Zealand. They've moved back to Australia because they've lost so many people. Um, the city that I used to live in, uh, there used to be six Masonic lodges. Now they're down to one because they really are shrinking. I don't know if we're responsible for it, but as long as they find Jesus, I don't mind. Uh, the, the leaders, the highest levels within Freemasonry would never openly do anything that bad because that would bring public scorn on them for what they were doing. Because most people would have an inherent sense of, even if they're not churchgoers or whatever, uh, the, the three founders uh, or three leaders of the Theosophical Society, yes, they were 33rd degree Masons, but they were members of the Grand Orient Lodge, which is sort of mostly based in France. Um, they, would, they would prosper, I guess I would say, in countries that had a Catholic majority, um, Spain, Portugal, um, Italy, France, and so on. Um, that group, the, the Grand Orient Lodges, are pantheistic. They don't know what they worship, but they know they worship something. Whereas the British and American Grand Lodges would regard themselves as um, uh, worshippers of God, but any God will do. So it doesn't have to be the Christian God. Um, they would, I mean, a, a guy I've spoken with was a member of Lodge Singapore, and he said there were nine holy books on the altar, and they were regarded as equally inspired. So there's one from the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Sikhs and um, Zoroastrians and, and so on. It's to cover what goes on at the highest levels, yes. Um, that, would, that would describe, but, but I mentioned before that they actually admit in writing that they deliberately mislead those in the lower level so they won't ask awkward questions. Now, for example, there is no Masonic Lodge in the planet where you're allowed to use the name of Jesus if you're part of the ritual uh, or if you're the chaplain and you lead a prayer. Um, I remember speaking in a church in Seattle, Washington, uh, about this at the request of the local Episcopal priest. Um, and I had the Grand Bible Bearer, for, <laughs> that was his title, for the state of Washington, um, who challenged some of the things that I said and got a bit antsy about it. And he was sort of prideful. But what I found interesting, he actually sort of did a transcribe of what I spoke at uh, that particular meeting on the first time that I was there. And he put it on the Facebook, uh, sorry, on a, an internet site for the Grand Lodge of Washington at the time. But he, I'm damned by faint praise. He said I was the most balanced anti-Mason he'd come across. So <laughs> I guess I could live with that. But I was explaining, and see, this is the thing. In the very first degree, one of the things they do when they bring the man in to go through the ritual to begin with, they put a blindfold on, a hoodwink. And so spiritually, he's regarded as blind, and the lodge is the source of light. So that's why they're Luciferians, because Lucifer is the light bringer, and that's the, that's the connection that they often make. Well, you'll, you'll see their black and white checkerboard floor. There's one in the foyer of the New Zealand Parliament, for example, and I think the British one, if I remember rightly, and that'll, that'll tell you plenty. Um, at, at heart, 
from my perspective as a Christian, I would say they were just simply sold out to Satan, but they don't recognize Satan. They think Satan's the bad guy and Lucifer's the good guy. And they think Jesus, at the highest levels, they'll admit that Lucifer and Jesus are really the same being, two sides of the same being. Well, that's just nuts. That's, that's crazy, but that's what they believe. That's what they teach once you get past the 30th degree. Um, and, and there are a handful of people of that level in New Zealand. You need to be born again. Is I it, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. No. And you're, hey, what you're about confirming those hospitals? They, you know, they, they you know what, sir? See, this is what a Mason confesses, is that Lucifer is light. I've, I've written a book on called Signs and Symbols explaining what all sorts of logo, logos mean. It's an e-book as well. But I, there were so many Freemasonry ones, I actually started a whole separate uh, part two going through the square and the compass um, and, and some of the other lodges that are with it, the Buffaloes and D. Malay and the Grand Orient and so on. Uh, Walt Disney was a member of the Masonic Lodge. Um, I mean, there's plenty of them. Bill Clinton was in D. Malay. Uh, George H. W. Bush was 33rd degree. So was, um, what's his name, Carter, the peanut farmer from Georgia. He, was, he said he was thrice born, which means he was born again and born again again because he was in the 33rd degree, so he's fully illuminated. And, and he's 99 now, so um, he's about to meet Jesus, and Jesus will have to tell him, I'm sorry, but what you did in the lodge was not what I want. Uh, virtually every country I know of has a law that says you're not allowed to keep human body parts unless you're a medical research facility registered for that purpose. It tells me it's a death cult, fundamentally. There would be a skeleton there, and part of the wording is that may, may death hug me if I ever spell out what goes on in the lodge. So these are death cult. This is a death cult. Let's call it what it really is. It's not the only one around, but um, there's a few religious groups around that are just death cults. Um, you know, um, and and most of them are into what I'd call the spooky stuff. They're into spiritism in some form or another. Uh, we shouldn't be playing with body parts of people who have passed. We're supposed to treat them with respect and bury them or cremate them or whatever. So, you know, I, I just think anybody who's involved in that, yes, the, the rituals can involve what amounts to a blood covenant. And in having, um, uh, having dealt with over the last 25 years or so, uh, a lot of ministry with ritual abuse and so on, um, I've come across five people who have been participants against their will in what I could only describe as Masonic ritual abuse. The ritual abuse happened in a Masonic lodge, usually in the star in the um, middle of the uh, lodge room. Um, and quite frankly, any, any father or grandfather that takes their granddaughter and does um, sexual stuff or whatever there is just perverted. And quite frankly, um, God's not happy and he's going to make that very clear to them at some point. But I've, I've, I've heard about it, but I've actually met five people who have been participants in it against their will, just doing it as kids. They were being initiated into something. I was born in a western suburb in Auckland, New Zealand. I would be uh, put into a van and taken to Freemasons once a month there, there would be other children. Satanic ritual abuse would take place. There were many men there, and I'm not saying every Freemason was a pedophile, but I'm saying at certain levels throughout their hierarchy, they were. So it, that's sick, and anyone who does it needs to the full weight of the law against them. Trouble is, a lot of police are members of the Masonic Lodges as well. So um, I was very interested in, in um, the time when Tony Blair was Prime Minister of Britain, there was a case where a, a, a bank robber 
one of the biggest known bank robbers in, in um, uh, London was a member of a Masonic lodge that five members of the lodge were also policemen. And they wouldn't arrest him, even though they knew who he was, because he was a lodge brother. So this leads to corruption as well. Yeah, you'll you'll find these little obelisks a bit like the war memorials, but a, a much smaller um, one because you don't want to make it too big in a in a cemetery. Um, but you'll you'll find those were always Freemasons. Sometimes they won't use the obelisk, but if they do that, they probably were master of a lodge or certainly held a reasonably high office. Uh, a lot of the lower ones probably wouldn't go to that. It's not done so much nowadays. They just have a piece of uh, of marble and, and it's just a slab with some writing on it. But uh, historically, you can tell a lot of those. And usually they would try and be in the highest place. If the cemetery um, had a bit of a ground slope, they would try and be put into the highest place as so as sovereign over the cemetery. Uh, Shriners is, is unique to North America. You'll find some in Canada, mostly it's American. Um, in part of their ritual, they claim that uh, Allah is the God of their fathers. They're actually secret Muslims. Uh, these are, you have to be a 32nd degree Mason in America to join it. Um, the American lodge system is a bit unique uh, compared to the British and the Commonwealth, British Commonwealth. Um, in America, they have three main groups. Uh, there's the northern jurisdiction, which is in 15 states, the sort of original states of the US as it was forming. Uh, the southern one um, covers the rest of the states, and they have Prince Hall, which is for people who are African Americans, because they really weren't encouraged to join, but the, the original Freemasons were mostly fairly racist. The Ku Klux Klan founder was one of the senior Freemasons, Albert Pike. Uh, I've, I've seen Pike's Peak in Colorado more than once. And um, it, he, was, he was a dedicated Freemason, wrote a lot of their rituals, which were very occultic. The uh, National um, Masonic headquarters in Washington, D.C., it looks like it's come straight out of ancient Egypt, complete with the lion sphinxes, and all that sort of stuff. I've been through the um, the Masonic Temple in um, Indianapolis. I mean, it's six stories. On the, I think it's the third floor. I'm open to correction on that. They've got a ballroom. You can have two thousand people dancing in one room. That's how big the place was. And um, so, you know. Um, it's, it's really controlled America, it's controlled Canada, it's certainly controlled Britain, um, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, um, through their membership and the, just the subterfuge of how they've organized themselves. What I'm pleased to say is that so many of them have come out and they've found Jesus and they've got their lives sorted spiritually or they're underway to do that. There's a, there's a number of other organizations that have a sort of a Masonic connection. I mentioned before about how the landed gentry and so on, the aristocracy, almost took over Freemasonry because of their involvement with groups like the Theosophical Society. Golden Dawn is one of those. There's a number of other ones. I would see those as just simply occult groups, um, probably think they're doing good things. They're after spiritual knowledge. People are looking for a spiritual experience and they get involved in the Spiritualist Church and Golden Dawn and some of these other groups. They're, they're replete around. In fact, the headquarters for a lot of those in New Zealand, there's two main areas. One is uh, Havelock North and the other would be Paikakariki. And you'll find several occultic organizations, their national headquarters are in Paikakariki on the Kapiti Coast for those who are aware of the geography. So, you know, and but a lot of these have a sort of a cross-pollination with Freemasonry. They're not Masonic in and of themselves, but they're borrowed bits from each other. Alistair Crowley, who did, who founded the Church of Satan with Anton de LaVey, um, the, <laughs> They, they were occultists. Well, in, in New Zealand, it's been my, my privilege to 
uh, to teach from Invercargill to Kerry Kerry in about 50 towns and cities. Um, it's just, you know, I respond usually to invitations. I've spoken in four states in Australia, in four provinces in Canada. I've, I've lost track in America. I think it's over 20 states, um, taught in Africa and India and so on. So, but a lot of a lot of my teaching is in book form, and now it's on downloadable video from our website, uh, which is jubileeresources.org. Um, and people around the world are finding stuff. People are downloading books in Polish and Ukrainian and and all these other languages that we've been working on just because it's time to use the technology. If I can't travel because of lockdowns and, and stuff, um, then we're going to get the message out one way or the other. So the spiritual realm is real, um, but the occultic realm, which is the the negative, the bad side, the things that God doesn't want us dabbling in, um, seances and and all that sort of stuff. Um, Maori tohonga are very good at cursing. Um, one of the national heads of our education department uh, wrote a very interesting uh, book about this called The Maori School of Learning. I'll think of his name in a minute. I've mentioned it in my book. Um, and he talked about the three lessons that tohunga had to learn uh, in order to be a tohunga. They usually were a Timothy to a Paul, if you like. They were learning under one. Uh, they had to be able to split a tree trunk or a rock with just words. Now, that's power. The second lesson was to kill a bird as it flew by, just by cursing it. And the third one is that you had to kill someone. And they often were encouraged to try to kill their tutor because that gave them mana or, or prestige, if you like. Um, and I know of cases where uh, a tribe has, um, something's happened and they've needed to go and collect shellfish while the tide's down, but the tide's coming in and they haven't got enough for their, uh, their families. And so the tohunga will hold the curse, uh, sorry, speak a curse over the waves to keep it out until they've gathered the food. Now, I've heard cases of that uh, in New Zealand. So the tohunga is just a witch doctor, if you like, a shaman. Um, and that needs to be repented of by those who have had training in that before they can really adequately come to Jesus uh, and be free of the bondage that they brought on their people. Um, there's, there's a real renaissance in, in Tohunga-ism, and that's the term they would use, um, up the Whanganui River, at the top end of it, for example, uh, that I'm aware of. It's, it's not uncommon, but the vast majority of Maori in New Zealand would actually have some faith in the biblical God and, and through uh, Jesus Christ. Um, Unfortunately, particularly the Anglican Church in New Zealand was involved with the British military in taking land off them. And a lot of that has begun to be put right, but not sufficiently yet. So um, Maori who know about their history uh, need to be able to be encouraged to say, uh, the God of the Christians did not tell them to come steal your land. And, and those who think that happened, we apologize to because that simply is wrong. Okay, well, New, New Zealand is, uh, we've got 6 million Kiwis, 5 million live at home. There's always about a million overseas. My best guess, and it's only that, but my best guess is there's about 3 million uh, with Masonic curses in their families. Um, and so we're never going to be short of dealing with um, those on an individual basis. There's always going to be a cue saying, can you set me free? Here are the symptoms that I can see in my family. Um, we've trained people up and down the country. So a lot of uh, pastors and other parts of prayer teams in different churches. Um, Bill Sabritsky, probably our top evangelist, uh, who's passed away now, but uh, he used a lot of our material all around the world. Um, and, and particularly to do with Freemasonry, introduced it to the Toronto Airport Fellowship amongst other places. So, um, you know, he, he, sh he opened a lot of doors that I was able to go through afterwards. But the, the bottom line is if, if your life isn't perfect, there's probably something that's causing uh, the problem. Freemasonry may be an example. Um, there can be other things going on in families. 
in which case go get some help get cut the klingons off that's the way i refer to to demons words create curses but they're empowered by the spiritual realm which are the demonic uh, realm and so we just need to undo the curses and evict the demons and a lot of mental illness is caused by demons um, I, I think, and, and unforgiveness is a huge reason. Um, I remember running this past a few psychiatrists that I've met over the years. Uh, if you really want to get people out of a psychiatric unit, get them to forgive people. And I reckon you would clean out nearly half of the population in those institutions. And, and the psychiatrists have told me that's actually about right too. So um, that's their experience. So there's no reason to carry on all these burdens and have a screwed up life and, and think, is this as good as it gets? No, you can be free. And it's the Lord Jesus through the leading of the Holy Spirit that can help set you free. Well, my, my message to Freemasons is, is very simple. We love you in the Lord, but we don't love the deception you're in because of the damage it's doing to you as well as your family. And I found the answer in Romans chapter 10, the first four verses. Let me just read these and let me adapt it just slightly. It says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for you, for Freemasons, is that you may be saved. For I bear you witness that you have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For you being ignorant of God's righteousness... Seek to establish your own righteousness. Have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ, Jesus, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the problem I see with, with Freemasons is they've established self-righteousness rather than relying on the righteousness of Jesus to get them safely into God's kingdom. So... I don't want you to go to hell, but that's Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. And so it's a real place. So my, my heart's desire is just find the real Jesus, and you can't do it if you're submitted to the Masonic Lodge or these other groups that I've talked about. You just need to find the real Jesus. And you'll find some people, because God's got a remnant everywhere. And... Um, I would pray that you would find that truth, that you would not stay in deception anymore. Let me say what my friend said. Deceive people. Don't know they deceive people. That's the nature of deception. And this is not an area of ministry I would have ever chosen for myself. But I can tell you that coming to the real Jesus, letting the Holy Spirit not just be resident, but being president of your life. So you give him the steering wheel of your life in order to get free. And you, you will come and spend eternity together. And you can come and talk to me about it when, when we reach that place. But there is a heaven and there is a hell. And, you know, um, people say there's more than two genders. Well, no, there's only two. But eternity is only two choices. So will that be smoking or non-smoking? You need to make a choice. I hope you choose Jesus. Yes, for, for those of you who are in the um, central North Island, uh, Manawatu, Wanganui area, over to Taranaki and so on, um, on Saturday the 29th at the Waiora Marae in Wanganui, uh, I'm going to be leading a whole day uh, training course on how to start a fellowship in your home because institutional church is now preventing God's kingdom from growing enough. And so they've asked me to come and do that. So we're going to be doing that. The details are on our website, jubileeresources.org. Um, and the following Saturday, which will be the 6th of May, the day of the coronation for King Charles, um, we're actually doing one in the Manawatu at the Te Anui School Hall, uh, halfway between Palmerston North and Fielding. So uh, if you're able to, to come along to one of those and learn how we're going to learn together how to start a fellowship of kingdom believers in your homes, because 
Things are getting difficult. Will they get worse? Well, possibly. But God's kingdom is going to continue to grow because when Jesus comes, we're going to have a big party and we'd like you to be part of it. Hallelujah.